Yesterday we looked at um, a piston in an infinite rigid baffle. So we have this circular piston surrounded by this infinite rigid baffle. And we looked at the radiation field on the axis, which we call the z-axis here, the axis of symmetry. And we um, solved for the pressure field actually exactly and we found it behaved very interestingly. It has actually zeros and maxes <coughs> due to interference. And it's uh, useful because it points out this additional requirement that is needed for the far field in addition to this right here. It only comes in when the wavelength's small, which is not typical, but it's there. Uh, in general, it's there. So we set up, next what we're going to do is look at the, the radiation pattern in the far field at all angles here. From theta is equal to zero on the axis to theta is equal to 90 degrees. And remember the radiation pattern has to be symmetric about the z-axis because our system is symmetric about the z-axis. Uh, so we set this up, we integrated over line sources Okay, we, uh, we used our previous solution. I didn't point it out yesterday, but it's, uh, it's in the notes here. You have to double the pressure amplitude. And the reason is, when we solved for the line source, it wasn't in a baffle. But if you bring up a baffle very close to this, it's just gonna double, just gonna double the, radiation, the radiated pressure at every point. Okay, so we ended up, well, where we left off was with this expression right here. Uh, this is the pressure due, uh, due to one due to um, one of the line sources, one of these one of these elements right here. This distance right here is x. This is the x-axis right here. This distance is x. So our expression here for the far field pressure due to that line element. Um, we've got it in mixed, we've got x and phi, we've got to pick one of those, or a different, we've got to put it all in one variable to integrate it, right? So uh, we've got to pick one of them. It turns out that the, the better, it's, uh, it's best here to choose phi, and it's not real obvious, but uh, that's what we're going to choose. So, um, We have to uh, replace, this is going to be x, I guess. Let's see. You can see that the, um, the cosine of phi is x over a. Right? This is a right angle. There's the right angle here. So, and we, so we can get, we can do that. We have to replace the differential here. And that's just, this is just, you know, elementary calculus here. Yeah, here's the relationship. We take the differential. So this will allow us to uh, remove the dx that's there in terms of d phi. So you put all this together and you eventually end up and integrate from theta is equal to zero. Uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> theta is fixed. That's our field point. We're going to integrate here from phi is equal to zero to pi. We pick up all the elements by integrating from phi is equal to zero over here to pi. Pick up the element from here to there, and all the elements and all the line elements in between. So um, this is the integral. Now the next thing to notice, this is not simple, okay? The next thing to notice here, however, is that this is going to have a real and imaginary, this integral has a real and an imaginary part. If you look at the imaginary part, if you expand this exponential, e to the i anything is the cosine of that thing plus i times the sine of that. If you look at the imaginary part, it's going to vanish by symmetry. And I'll let you do that if, if you're interested. When you integrate over all phi, you're going to get equal negative and positive contributions. Um, I don't know if that's obvious by l but looking at it, but if you stare at it long enough or you write down, oh, here's the, yeah, 
here's the imaginary part's going to be proportional to this. This is this is even in phi. You know, it doesn't for phi less than 90 degrees and greater than 90 degrees. However, this changes sign. Now, I, to be honest with you, I can't see that right now, but you can prove this, okay? This function is odd. It changes sign about uh, phi being 90 degrees. And so it's going to give you zero. So we just have to worry about the real part. Here's the real part. Uh, so the real part's going to involve the cosine of all this right here. All right, and it turns out that's a complicated looking integral, but it turns out that it, it's um, it's an integral representation, it's proportional to an integral representation of a Bessel function. So you s encountered Bessel functions, I think, last quarter for oscillations of a membrane. Bessel functions often arise in circular problems like like that, but they arise in all kinds of other problems too. They're they're all over the place. It's considered a special function. It, um, it's more complicated than the standard functions, e exponential, sines, cosines, hyperbolic functions. So um, <coughs> historically, these, there's a whole bunch of special functions. I mean, they're you know, in the order of 100 of them, I would guess. I don't know. And they were primarily all investigated roughly in the 1800s. Um, there came, there came a need for more, you know, more sophisticated mathematics to handle physical problems. And um, a lot of mathematicians jumped in. I mean, they were interested, they're just they're interesting from, mathematical, from a mathematical perspective. But they arise in uh, all kinds of applications, these so-called special functions. And uh, Bessel functions was, were one of them. And these have been beaten to death. You can find out. Anything you want to know about special functions, you, you can find out. Um, the standard book is Abramowitz and Stegen, and I think it's on the internet now. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bram, oh, I think it's Witz Z, or Abramowitz. These are, I guess, capitalized. Got a. Is this, this, that doesn't, no, that doesn't, I guess it's, yeah, I guess it's this. I'm not so sure. But um, this is the book that my generation, we all have in our offices or somewhere. This is a real thick book. And it gives you all kinds of properties of special functions. And like I said, they've been, it, it's just unbelievable the work that was done. And it's really good that it was done because you can see here, um, you know, it's not, Normally, you wouldn't even think of representing a function as an integral like this. You wouldn't even think of that. But you can see how it can be useful, all right? So, um, so my generation, we all have a copy of this in Dover. It's cheap. It was originally cheap. It was a, th these people worked for the federal government. So it was, it was made, it was really a cheap book, hardbound. Uh, now, I, I've heard, as I mentioned, that it's, you can get at it on the internet, I think, without having to pay anything, but I'm not sure. But anyway, this is the standard book for all these properties. <coughs> so we need to just set, um, this is J of Z, you'll recognize here, we need to set Z equal to K8 in our problem, K times the sine of theta. Um, <coughs> when we do that, and you pay attention to what this Z out in front here and, and everything here, it's easy to show that our instantaneous pressure is going to look like this. We're interested in just the amplitude, so we kill this part. We don't worry about this I. And then we do this decomposition, right, or factoring. That's very common when dealing with the radiation field of sources. There's a radial part and an angular part, basically, okay? The, the radial part is called the axial pressure, and this is identical to what we saw before in the far field. We're in the far field now, okay? But if you go back and look, you will find that um, this expression, this right here, uh, I think it's, let's see, is it that? Yeah. So I think it's, if you go back and look at the notes, you'll see that this right here is the far field axial pressure. So that's, we call it this. And we introduced this before for this source, the line source, right? 
this kind of decomposition or factorization here. And um, the rest of this here is the angular part, which is called the directional factor, h. And so we can identify it here. And in this case, because we already solved for the axial pressure, this has to have the property that it, when theta is equal to zero, which means you're on the axis, h has to be one, because you've got to get just the axial pressure. So um, this is actually an incorrect statement here. Has been prop this is, I need to edit this. The limit as theta goes to zero for h had better be one here, or there'd be a mistake. And you can verify that it's, um, that it's true. Um, and again, this is typically some, uh, I think the back of the book, there'll be some Bessel properties in the back of KFCS. I know that the zeros are in there, because you know, we we're always looking those up. But there'll be other properties in there. But anyway, the limit as V goes to zero, and V is this quantity that we encountered before in the, the line source, it's K times the sine of the angle. Um, and the limit as V goes to zero, this is equal to, this is equal to one. So H is properly normalized. So what does this look like? It looks a lot like the line source, <laughs> okay? It, as you look in, in the far field of the line source, as you look at different angles here. It's a, qualitatively, it's a damped sinusoid. And that's what Bessel functions are, qualitatively. You can think of them as a, as a sinusoid that, whose amplitude falls off with distance, right? And you know this from, um, <coughs> from modes on a membrane. You guys did this last quarter, right? A, a circular membrane. If you look at the standing wave modes. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, this is just this, this is the angular function. How do we apply it to our problem? Well, as almost always, to, to get an appreciation for the radiation field, we look to where the zeros are. Those are the, usually the simplest things to locate, and they're the most dramatic cases where you have no pressure. So you can see here there are going to be nodes. These are going to correspond to pressure nodes. Now this is V here, and you remember V is equal to Ka times the sine of the angle. So if we know where the zeros are for V, we can then find the angles, the nodal angles. And incidentally, these will, of course, be cones, right? So if this is our piston here in this baffle, and it's vibrating. Here's our axis of symmetry. In the far field, there will be, in general, it depends on the value of Ka. If the wavelength is big here, you're not going to have any zero pressures. You can't do, get destructive interference, okay? But in general, they'll be at some angle here, and they will be cones, okay? Make sure you see this. Because, of, because this is an axis of symmetry. The z-axis is an axis of symmetry. In the far field, if I'm at a zero here, it's going to be a zero all the way around like that, right? On this, on the, on this surface. And again, as I told you, just as in the line source, as you become closer to the source, these co cones will distort. They tend to go like, they'll go like this. It's only in the far field that we get these nice cones. So, the next problem we have here is if we want to calculate these, which we want to do, where do these zeros occur? Well, if I had an exact damp sinusoid, it would, you know, if it was like, if it was like, you know, the sine of, if it was this, if it went like this, which it does for the line source, we got that right, then the zeros are going to correspond to the zeros of the sine, which is elementary. We know, how to, we know how to do that. Well, the Bessel functions are not so simple. There is no analytical representation for the zeros of the Bessel function here except when you're far away. They asymptotically approach. This, when you're asymptotically, when you're far away here, okay, it'll start to approach 
an exact damped sinusoid with a phase. So it'll look like, it'll look like this far away, but, you, but there's a phase in here. And if you want to know, you want to know what, what that function is, you look in Abramowitz and Stegen, okay? That's what, that's what I think everybody, just about everybody does. And there's other sources out there, but that's the standard one, at least for my generation. For you guys, I don't know, you're on your own, you know? There's too much. <laughs> but, um, okay, so, so anyway, so we have to deal with numeric, these are solved for numerically. Unless you're in, unless you want in the asymptotic limit. And incidentally, you know, all these special functions, they've been looked at and the asymptotic, their expressions asymptotically, approximate expressions. And then near in here, you know, there's no analytical function, no analytical representation of a Bessel function. You know, like in terms of elementary functions. So, but they do exist in special cases when you get close to the origin here and when you get far away. So anyway, what we do, because in acoustics we're usually interested in the low-lying zeros here, almost always, you, we look these up, they're in the uh, appendix, an appendix of KFCS, and here are the first few, the first three, um, and uh, incidentally, we're dealing with J1 here, there's a J0, there's a, you know, there's, there's a JM, Okay, and m doesn't have to be an integer. Once the mathematicians sunk their teeth into these special functions, they generalized them. They didn't care about applications, a lot of them, which is, that's fine, you know. They're interested in just mathematical properties. They've generalized this to a fractional. I think this can even be complex, believe it or not, the index here. Bizarre, okay. So mathematicians, you know, that's what they do. And then, you know, 100 years later, we find an application. This happens all the time. History is replete with this kind of thing. Mathematicians have done something. Without regard to reality, you know, they do something that people think will never be applied. And then 100 years later, something is applied. You know, this, this, this standard, you guys know about this, right? Our, um, standard case is uh, Riemannian four-dimensional geometry. Riemann did this. People probably said, What's, what's he doing? You know, we live in a three-dimensional space. Who cares about four dimensions? Well, it has all kinds of applications. And Einstein lifted the four-dimensional theory for his general theory of relativity. Because it's natural, as some of you have probably heard, it's natural to combine, to think of time as a fourth dimension, right? So, okay, well, enough about special functions. I just, but I wanted to give you the flavor of, you know, because when you hit these more difficult problems, you don't necessarily have to run to a computer to simulate them. You can, there are analytical ways of approaching complicated problems. But you, ultimately, you're going to need to deal with these special functions almost always. Okay, so here they are, to three or four figures here. Um, the nodes, remember, V, when V is equal to one of these, we're going to have a node. So that means Ka times the sine of theta is equal to this. And there's going to be... Depending upon your value of Ka, you will have so many of these. This is just like the line source. If the wavelength is very large, you won't have any solutions. If the wavelength is small, you're gonna have a lot of these. They're, these cones are gonna be packed in here densely. So this is how we find, we just invert this. And here are some special cases, here's some marching along here. Starting, we usually start at long wavelength. At very long wavelengths, how's this thing gonna be radiating? It's going to be isotropic in this, hemis in this upper plane, here, upper space here. As, it, uh, as you swing around here and measure the pressure amplitude at a fixed distance, distance, it won't change at long wavelength. It's a small source. So it radiates isotropically. Um, that's Ka much less than one, long wavelength. Um, then as it's not, as you start to increase Ka, eventually this hemisphere here, your radiation pattern, which is a hemisphere, is going to distort. And what it'll do is it will, um, it'll start to, it'll be bigger here than it'll, it'll come in like this, okay? And what it's headed towards is a node at 90 degrees. The next thing that happens is when Ka hits J11, 
that corresponds to a 90 degree. You're going to have a node. So it'll look, the radiation pattern, the far field radiation pattern, will look something like this. Remember, the meaning of the radiation pattern is as you swing along here, this, this distance is proportional to the pressure. So it'll be a maximum up here, and right here it'll be zero. It, 90 degrees will be a zero. And you can see that in the math here. When this is equal to a 3.83, Okay, and if Ka is equal to the same number, if K is equal to that, the sine of this is going to be 1, theta is going to be 90 degrees. So the node is just emerging right there at this value. As you increase, as you decrease the wavelength, which is increasing Ka, then you will start to get a pattern, the kind of pattern that we've seen, for example, with the line source. And um, so here, what this will look like is there'll be one, when you're in this, between these two zeros, you'll have a, something like this. Okay, and this will look like, I don't know what this is going to look like. It depends where you are. But you'll have, um, and again, this is an axis. This is the axis of symmetry. This gets rotated around. You'll have a radiation field that looks something like this. There'll be one nodal cone. Right there. And etc. Et and when Ka is much greater than one, you're going to have a lot of nodal cones. So it's the same idea as the line source, and we'll do problems in this. Um, here's a sort of physical example. So again, this is, you know, I just don't know if this was commercial. I, it's, not, it's not anymore, but I think this is homemade, but I'm, I'm not sure. So we've seen similar beam patterns before, right? So again, this is now the logarithm. This is from, this is, um, must be Ka equals 10. It's very, it looks very similar to what's in the book for Ka is equal to 10 as an example. So here it is. And it looks, you know, it looks kind of strange here. It, you know, it, 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 it looks like, looks like something you'd see in Disneyland. Now that I think, you know, does it look, does it look like that to you guys? Is it, or is it too early in the morning? Savas, have you been to Disneyland? No, it's like chocolate fountain. <laughs> like what? Chocolate fountain, you know. Oh. Yeah, chocolate <laughs> So I think the reason it kind of looks strange here is not that they didn't make it right. I think it's because of the logarithm. This is the beam pattern. It's the logarithm of the of the pressure amplitude. Twenty times the log of te technically the well. It's it's down here, I think. Um, it's this, okay? H of zero is, of course, one. So, and the pressure is proportional to H. So, um, ignore this for right now. So, this is the beam pattern. We typically do this in logarithm, and this is a very standard. You know, we've seen this before, and maybe some of you have actually seen it in practice on, uh, for radar systems or acoustic systems. Here's, um, this is zero dB. This is by convention, the log of eight, the log of, you know, the directional factor is one, the log of one is zero. So um, the h is equal to one on the axis. So we call this zero dB, and here it is marked off in units of, uh, you know, 10 dB here. Everything else is going to be down by so many dB. And um, we'll solve for these angles. Uh, in a few seconds, but I just wanted to mention to you that one of the reasons people <coughs> use logarithms here, and we've seen this before, is that, you know, this is one-tenth of the amplitude, it's not bad, but when you get down to 40, right around here is 40 dB, that's, the pressure amplitude is down by a factor of 100. So you will lose these details in the radiation pattern um, if you plotted a linear plot of this. So that's what the main, one of the main reasons that people use logarithmic plots decibel plots. How do we find these angles? Well, we know we're given this Ka value. If you look back on the previous page, the, the null is going to correspond to Ka times the sine of the angle equaling the Bessel. This is going to be the first one. Okay, As you come from zero, it will be the first one here. 
So we can invert that. Ka times the sine of the angle is equal to the root of a Bessel function. We can find the angle, and I get 22.5. It's the same thing that they got there. <coughs> then we go to the next zero. We look for the next zero. And it's going to be J12, the, the second Bessel zero, right? So I get 40, close to what they got, not the same, 44.6 degrees. What about the third one? What's the, uh, what's J13, do you remember? It's about 10, right? It's 10 point, it's about 10.2. Right? So where are we here? So J3 is going to be 10, and do, can we solve that? Can a, the sine of the angle be greater than one? No, we've run out of nodal cones. But we're close. 90 degrees is close to being a cone, and that's what you see. That's what you see here. You know, as you go to 90 degrees here. This is 90 degrees. You can see that the radiation pattern is very small. So that's it's and it's it's close here. Now, incidentally, it can't be zero on this plot. This is a logarithmic plot. But, so, but anyway, the point here and the way we say it is, we see a nodal cone here, one here. This is almost, 90 degrees is almost a nodal cone, but not quite. There is some pressure amplitude, non-zero pressure amplitude, when theta is equal to 90. Now, you may wonder, and it's um, often useful information, you know, in practice, you're usually picking up on this major lobe here, right? And these minor lobes are usually a nuisance. They're going to give you, they're going to bounce off things and come back if you're trying to detect something. So you usually don't like the minor lobes, okay? But so you, the natural question is, how, how big are they? How, you know, if you want to try to get a handle on whether or not you have to worry about them. So how many dB down is this right here? Well, you can't solve that analytically. Uh, just like in the line case, remember I mentioned that? It's a transcendental equation. But um, it can be approximate. You can look in tables of Bessel functions. Remember, this has got Bessel functions in it. And we'll do some problems like this. So it turns out that the, um, this peak right here, this, the next lobe, the secondary lobe here, has a... Um, the beam factor is going to be this, h of 0 is 1. It turns out the maximum is approximately minus 17.5 dB down from, from here. So this, and you can see on the scale here, it looks roughly about right, right? This is between 10 and 20 dB down. Turns out to be approximately 17.5 dB down. So I'm pretty sure we're going to do problem. There's tables of in the back in an appendix. I don't know if you guys did this in the last course, but we're going to do it in this course. I recall there's tables of of j1 of x divided by x, maybe with a two there. I don't know. There are tables, so we can look in the tables and we can interpolate. We'll. we'll I don't know if we're going to interpret. We'll probably just go to the nearest value in the table. We'll be doing homework problems in that. Um, OK, any questions so far? So you can see why we did the line source first, right? There, it was a lot simpler. But the idea is the same. You know, the fact that the, K, the radiation pattern is dictated by the Ka number, whether it's small or large compared to one or roughly on the order of one. Um, <clears throat> so people have used, uh, because this is, you know, we can do this analytically, this theory, people will apply it to um, a piston that doesn't have a baffle. You've got to be a little careful there, okay? But it's just going to be a rough approximation. But sometimes that's all you want. Okay, and incidentally, what does baffled mean? What does it mean in practice? Well, I, I'm not quite sure, and I had a long discussion with Professor Baker about, he knows more about these things than I do, and he doesn't, he doesn't 
He doesn't know either, okay? In other words, in a practical case, I'm gonna have some solid, surf rigid surface here. How big does it have to be such that I'm, I can use this, you know, use the theory to some good approximation? And I'm sure this has been quantified, it's just that we're not, we're not aware of it. But I would, I would think, you know, so you want to make this baffle, how big do you have to make this? Does it, do you need to compare it to the wavelength? Or do you need to compare it to the piston radius? What, what's the length scale there? What do you need to, or is it a weird combination of the two? I don't know. I don't know how, what that is. But um, I'm sure that, I, I would think the information's out there. I would think so, somewhere. Now, I'm gonna repeat something and, and um, that we've said before, but it's, I don't feel bad about that because it's really important. I wanna make sure you get it, okay? We have this piston here. One of the reasons we wanna baffle it, as I mentioned to you before, is if you just had a piston here, let's say this is a piston going like that, you've got a problem. What is the problem? It's a dipole source, as we discussed, right? And the point is this, is that when this thing is moving up and down, let's say it's, it's moving up, you have a compression here, you're gonna have an expansion here. These propagate outward, right? Now, if you're at very high frequency, you'll get a beam that's coming out of here. You'll get a sound beam. It's when the wavelength here, when the wavelength is much less than the radius, you're gonna get a beam that comes out like this, and then it'll slowly diffract in dis with distance, okay? It'll be like a laser. And if you ever take a, a laser pointer and, you know, shine it on some nearby object and you look at the, you'll see the diameter. If you then go out into a hallway and make sure you don't, doesn't go in anybody's eyes and you look at a distant surface, what's it look like? It's bigger. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, there's diffraction. You cannot, you know, it's, diffraction is a fact of nature. Waves spread. But it depends on the wavelength. It's small wavelength. Well, this will be a, 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 a decent radiator of sound. But it has to be a very small wavelength compared to this. The typical case, when the wavelength is comparable to or less than this, what happens is this, this waves, waves here diffract and come around. And this expansion that I've drawn just here, it actually is, comes out and spreads all the way around here, and it'll tend to cancel that compression. So dipole sources tend to be very weak in the, radi the radiation pattern. Um, and in fact, as I pointed out to you yesterday, or the, I don't know when, um, our theory here only deals with volume sources that have a volume change. There's no volume change in the source. It has a, Q, a source strength of zero. So according to our theory, it does not radiate. Well, it actually does radiate, but it's going to be weak radiation, unless the wavelength's very short. So let's look at some demonstrations here. I love this demonstration. I heard about this at an acoustical. I saw it, somebody demonstrated it at an acoustical society meeting a long time ago, and I just knew I had to build it, okay? So we have four loudspeakers here, identical loudspeakers. They're in enclosures, as you can see, okay? There's a switching box here. And what I did with the switching box is here's the signal coming in from the function generator and an amplifier. Okay, it'll be 200 hertz. So the wavelength is one, about 1.7 meters. So we're at, a, we're at a pretty big wavelength here. This is a fairly small source here. Okay, don't expect to hear nodes, okay, if we were in the anechoic chamber. Now, due to reflections in this room, you can, you can hear nodes, but there won't, be, there won't be a lot of them. So what's this? This controls, the signal comes here, it goes to all of the loudspeakers. But here I can control the phase. This is the off position. So what I'm doing right here is, when I go like this, let's go ahead and turn this. So this I think is, um, this, yeah, this one right here. Okay, I'm controlling it. It's off right now, has a phase. When I go like this, it shouldn't sound different to you, okay? What I'm doing is, the reason it doesn't sound different is I'm just, flipping the phase by 180 degrees relative to the signal coming in. So I just flip the polarity. That's what the switch does. And you can see here I can control all of them, right? So, oops, it's a little loud. So 
so now, see all the switches are up? This is now acting as a monopole source. They're all going like this. And there's a very obvious way to represent this. So this represents the fact that they're all in phase. We have a monopole source. Now, look at this. What did I just do there? Now what kind of source do we have? <laughs> we have a dipole source. And it looks like these are going to be in phase. These are going to be in phase. So it's going like this. OK? And now, you know, we, could, we can model this. Our, our theory with the source string doesn't apply here. There's, only, there's, one, there's no volume change here. And the point is, you want to listen to this. The, the amplitude will fall significantly, right? You hear that less amplitude. We're at long wavelengths here. So to um, a rough approximation, these things are on top of each other. That's going actually a little too, you know, they're, they're close to each other. They're tending to cancel. So the radiation pattern is down. Now there's another thing we can do here. What if I do that? Before I did this, wow, they're different, aren't they? Do they sound different to you guys? So what you're listening to right now is this, right? But we can also do this. Instead of them going like this, and go like, that's a dipole source. And you'd expect the amplitude to be about the same. So here's the monopole. Here's our first dipole. Well, let's, let's do it. From, that's the first dipole. The next one looks like this. It's, it's significantly down. Yeah, I don't understand that. <laughs> I expect these for a long wavelength to be the same. Well, you know, a problem with a real system like this, these aren't identical speakers. In fact, we've had to play with this before. I think they've had... Um, we've actually replaced these to try to get loudspeakers that are more identical. Yeah. Now, we, we don't have to stop here. There's another possibility. That's, so we, we saw this, we saw this, and we saw this. Then there's this. OK, so that would look like this. And now this is called, this is an example of what's called a quadrupole. It's a dipole, it's a quadrupole. And the reason it's called something different is you can see that this source is tending to cancel this, but it's adding with this one. Look at this. Its nearest neighbors are out of phase. You get better cancellation. So let's go through this. There's the monopole. There's the first dipole. There's the quadrupole. You can hear it's definitely down, right? And you can see that's the quadrupole arrangement right there. Um, okay, next is, here's what we call a, a raw loudspeaker. So can you guys hear this maybe faintly? Okay. So this is this at 200 hertz, long wavelength. It's not a very efficient radiator because of the cancellation. I can put it in an enclosure, and here I'm going to baffle it, okay, and listen to the changes. Now, I'm not going to change the voltage. I'm just going to take it here and put it in here. I think you can hear it's a lot louder, right? Now, it's louder for two reasons. Well, two basic reasons. Um, we're turning the dipole into a monopole, big difference. But we also have this baffle here, right? And that doubles the pressure. Remember that? that that's doubling the pressure. There's another effect that I didn't notice, but somebody, after I demonstrated this at a show for physics teachers, some, some high school physics teacher, or maybe community college teacher came up to me and he said, he said, uh, you know, this is in contact with the wood, and could you have a sounding board effect here? This vibrating will cause the, our rigid baffle to not be so rigid and actually radiate sound. And I think he's right. Because, listen to this. So here it is. And I think you can hear it getting louder. I'm not touching it yet, but as soon as I touch it, 
here it go up. Um, there's issue. There's a viscous penetration depth issue here. I don't want to get into it, but I just want to say the bottom line is I think he was right. I think there's this third effect here. This thing's acting as a soundboard. <coughs> Uh, okay, any questions? Okay. Um, now, next, impedance. Very useful <coughs> because it links, and we've said this before and you've encountered it last quarter, it links the drive with the response, okay? And let me remind you of, of last quarter. Here's a, uh, we have some mechanical drive, we're driving a string under tension. Here's a standard model, the mechanical side of a driver. Um, it's got some, you know, damping, some stiffness and some inertia. This could be a shaker right, or, or a loudspeaker, right, driving this string right here. And the electrical side is, is represented here, typically electrical side. This is the, what we're going to call the external force, okay? So we have a transducer here. It has a mechanical side and an electrical side. The relationship between those two is a whole course. That's 4454. So we don't want to get into that right now. We're just going to give some reasonable mechanical model for the, for the model for the mechanical side of the transducer here. And this we're just going to treat as an externally applied force. Um, <coughs> Now, the idea here is this. This externally, what the electrical side or what the externally applied, applied force it sees here. It sees, this, we, this is the way people call it, that we, we see a certain impedance here. The impedance in this case is the force divided by the velocity. Pressure is not relevant here in this case. It's, it's force. So we redefine the impedance to be force here. And the velocity is the velocity of that. And the ratio of the two, the drive divided by the response, is the impedance. Now, there are two impedances here. There's going to be the wave impedance in the string here, and then the mechanical impedance of this damped harmonic oscillator here. And the forces add, the force exerted by this on this point, add to this, the force of the string. The velocities are the same. So, the total impedance seen by the external drive here will just be the sum of the impedances. So this is how people naturally think about it. We're going to prove it in the acoustic case. And you can prove this. And you did last quarter. You can, with Newton's second law, you can form the impedance here. And you can prove that the total impedance is the sum of the two impedances in this case. But I just want to point out to you that it's, it's pretty obvious, OK? Because the forces add and the velocities are the same. The total force here is going to be the sum of these two forces, so I can split it up into these two individual impedances. The impedance of the, the driver here, the mechanical impedance, is this. You recognize this as just a damped, simple harmonic oscillator. <coughs> and of course, for a string, the, for a semi-infinite string, the impedance is just the den linear density times the speed of waves. And again, this is important because once we know this impedance, we can, um, often this is specified, the force is specified. If we know the impedance, we can get the response, we can get the velocity. That's the main use of impedance here. What about acoustics? Okay, well, it's the same idea. Now we have this radiating surface. Let me jump, maybe it's best to jump to the diagram here. We have this uh, radiating surface. Now, I should say that you want to imagine that this is enclosed, okay, for our ca the case we're interested in monopole sources. So imagine this has been turned into a monopole. All right, so the impedance is going to be, there's a force exerted by the surface on the fluid, which is equal and opposite to the force of the fluid on the source. It's going to be complicated here. It's not going to be uniform. That force, there's a radiation pattern here. You know, it can be quite complicated. So it's going to be our job to figure out what this impedance is here. But whatever it is, there's going to be um, locally a force here. Okay, and I need to show you the proper definition. 
So we look at each element. There's an impedance due to each element, the force divided by the velocity, and then we integrate over the whole moving surface. In our case, <coughs> we're just looking at cases where the velocity is the same at each element, right? Like in the pulsating rod, all of our cases in this course are gonna be like that. So this comes outside the integral, and we just end up with the total force. But it's not obvious, again, what that is. It, it can, it's gonna be complicated, because we've got, the information that goes in here depends upon the radiation pattern here, which we've seen is not very simple. So what you can do here, and I'll let you do this if you want to, you did a similar thing I think in 3119. You can write down Newton's second law for the motion of this mass right here, the, the moving mass or the, the diaphragm, often called the diaphragm. You look at all the forces on there, there's a damping force, there's the mechanical damping force, there's a stiffness force, there's an external force plus the force of the, the fluid on there, which was a minus sign, because Fs is the force of the diaphragm on the fluid, so the, the force of the fluid on the diaphragm has a minus sign. You can look at the force, set it equal to the mass times the acceleration. Substitute in the individual impedances here, the radiation impedance, I can get rid of that, substitute in there, and <coughs> go to velocity here. Instead of these displacements, go to velocity, and what you find is, the total impedance is the sum of the individual impedances, just like for a string. Okay, here's the mechanical impedance, which is going to be the same as an, it's an oscillator. Damped, it's this. Okay, and now what's this? What's this? That's the radiation impedance. We call it the radiation impedance. We need to solve for that. So we'll solve for that. We're well, not today. But I just want to point out some simple. Um, <coughs> something simple here, and we did something very similar for spherical waves. Okay, and you know of course any complex number can be written as a real part plus an imaginary part. So <coughs> the radiation impedance here will have a real part which we call the radiation resistance. And this is going to be the part of the power that is driven, you know, that, that's emitted, it's not coming back. This is the power that's radiated into the acoustic field. This is the radiation reactance, the imaginary part here. That's the near field interacting with our drive, energy shuttling back and forth. It's a, it's a reactive thing. Remember, it's like driving a capacitor. You know, you're not dissipating any energy. Energy's going in, coming out, or an inductor. Energy's coming in and going out. So it's important actually, this is of obvious important in acoustics because we want to know, you know, usually you want to maximize this, okay? You want to get as much, this is, many con connect, this is going to be connected to the radiation power. That's what we're going to establish right now. This is also important and we'll see tomorrow why this is important, all right? But let's look at the radiation resistance right now. So this is going to be very similar to, um, to, um, it's similar to a string, and you might have done this in a string, I can't remember in 3119, but we looked at this for the, a spherical, a, a traveling spherical wave. Remember we calculated the, the power radiated? So we did a, um, a very similar thing here. So the power radiated, the average power radiated, the power is the force times the velocity. If I've got this moving membrane here, the instantaneous power that I'm putting into it is the force times the velocity. That's the simple mechanics, right? That's, that's the power. It's the work per unit time. And the work's the force times the displacement. So if you do it per unit time, it's the force times the velocity. And I average this over time. This is the average power that I'm putting into the system. Where does that power go? It goes into the radiated field, it's the sound field. It gets radiated. So we call that capital pi. <clears throat> so we need to analyze this. Well, we can do it from the impedance approach. We know that the impedance obeys this. We can get rid of Fs here in terms of the impedance. Okay, so we need to time average this product. We substitute the impedance in here. Okay, then we use this simple identity, which I think we've seen before, but it's, it's a simple complex identity. And the power reduces to these two terms. We get two terms here. This term, the imaginary part of the velocity, this is the velocity of the surface or the velocity of the fluid right on the surface. They've got to be the same by the boundary condition. 
This is oscillating sinusoidal. So this is like a cosine. That's a sine. The average is zero. This is the radiated part um, right here. This is the. This is going to give us. This is going to give us our power. And what's this quantity right here? This, there's technically a mistake here. There should be square brackets. I'll edit this in. This is not real clear what this means here. It's the real part of u, that quantity squared. That's what comes out of this identity here. Well, that's easy. It's just oscillating sinusoidally, right? That's going to be the square amplitude divided by 1 half because it's oscillating sinusoidally. So it's going to give us a capital U naught squared divided by 2. And in the end, what we find here is this very simple formula. We've seen this before, right? The power radiated is one half times the square of the peak velocity of the surface times the radiation resistance. And this is, looks the same as for a resistor, where this is the current. What's analogous to the current is the velocity. This is the you know, peak current squared divided by two. And instead of the radiation resistance, we have the electrical resistance. So it's very easy to uh, remember. And we've seen some seen similar to this before. And the advantage of this is, is that once we know the radiation resistance, we can calculate the radiated power, which is, like I said, is almost always an important quantity in acoustics, the total radiated power. You can also run it in reverse. Watch this. This is kind of interesting. We know that for any small, unbaffled source, if you look back, you'll see we have this formula for the radiated power. This is one of those formulas we established early in this chapter, OK? So if you look at this and this, if you beat this into this form, in other words, if you extract out a 1 half, well, we already got a 1 half, then we need a u naught squared. So I need to get rid of the source strings here, and it's just going to be the area times the velocity. All right? And now I've got 1 half u naught squared. All of this stuff in here has to be the radiation resistance. So the radiation resistance of a small source, unbaffled, has to be this expression. These are both, these are equivalent. So we've kind of turned the tables on this. If, it's, if you've got a baffle, you need to double this. Remember, for a baffle, the radiated power is doubled. Right? Um, OK, any quick questions? OK, so what's tomorrow's Wednesday? So I guess we'll continue with this tomorrow.